Hi, my name is Steve Snyder, and I'm author of the book Shot Down, the true story of pilot Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth. I'm also on the board of directors and past presidents of the 306 Bomb Group Historical Association and on the board of directors of the 8th Air Force Historical Society. And it's the mission of these two organizations to remember, honor, and educate, to remember the air war over Europe, to honor the men who fought it, and to educate the public about it. And that's the purpose of my PowerPoint presentation. Growing up, I knew the basics of my dad's World War II history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. His plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. He flew bombing missions over occupied Europe, and in February of 1944, his plane was shot down over Belgium. And he was missing in action for seven months, but he evaded capture and made it back to England. But it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I really had the time to delve into my dad's war history in more detail. And my parents had kept a lot of material from the war years, and I just wanted to go through that and organize it and learn more details. And at that time, I had absolutely no intention of writing a book. And there were two items that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action about his plane being shot down. That's absolutely riveting, uh, so much so that it was included in two books that were written. On the left is The Mighty Eighth by Gerald Astor. It was about the Eighth Air Force who flew high altitude daylight precision bombing missions over occupied Europe and Germany. Their first mission was on August 17th, 1942. And the goal was to hit industrial and military targets uh, to cripple Nazi Germany's ability to wage war. Uh, the Eighth Air Force got the moniker the Mighty Eighth by noted historian Roger Freeman because of the number of bombers they could put up on missions, which numbered into the hundreds. And on December 24th of 1944, 2,000 bombers hit targets around Berlin, which is, I can't even imagine what that must have been like uh, as bombers were dropping bombs uh, there were bombers back in England that hadn't even taken off yet. Uh, the other book was First Over Germany by Russell Strong. It was about the 306 bomb group that my dad was in. Russell Strong was a navigator in the 306 bomb group. He became his historian after the war. Uh, the motto of the, first, uh, the 306 bomb group, First Over Germany, was because the 306 bomb group was the first bomb group in the 8th Air Force to hit a target in Germany. Wilhelmshaven on January 27th of 1943. The other item that was really significant were all the letters that my dad had written to my mother while he was stationed in Europe before being shot down. And sitting down and reading those letters uh, were, was just fascinating. My dad was very candid uh, in what he wrote in his letters. He wrote about what bombing missions were like, what life was like on the air base, what life was like in London and England at the time, escapades of him and his crew. And I just became fascinated with the story, and it became my passion. I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet and spent countless hours uh, doing research, downloading declassified military documents. I went on a quest to find relatives of all my dad's crew members to ask for them uh, any information that they could give me. Started going to World War II reuni reunions and listening to veterans tell their stories. And finally, three years into my research, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so compelling and so unique that it needed to be told. So I decided to write a book. Uh, it was four and a half years from the time I started my research to the time the book was published. And I actually did something kind of unique to publish the book. I formed my own publishing company called Seabreeze Publishing LLC, which is the name of the street that I live on in uh, Seal Beach, California. And then I contracted with independent professionals for all the associated services, such as editing, cover design, interior layout. Uh, the book uh, printer that I use for the hardcover is located in Michigan. And then the fulfillment house I use to distribute and store the books is in Indiana. The first half of the book builds up to the day that the plane was shot down. And then the second half of the book is all about what happens afterwards. And it's just not about my dad, but it goes into detail about what happened to each member of his crew and about all the courageous Belgian people that risked their lives trying to help them. And it's completely based on firsthand testimony by the people who were involved in the events. However, I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have written the book if it wasn't for two Belgian gentlemen. On the left, you see... Uh, Dr. Paul Delahaye uh, with my dad wearing his bomber jacket. Uh, that 
photo was taken in 1994, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and my dad's plane being shot down. And then on the right-hand side, you see me with Jacques Lalo. That was taken 20 years later at the 70th anniversary of the liberation. These two men were young boys during the war, and they were greatly affected by it. They saw firsthand atrocities committed against their family and friends. And later in life, they became local historians, and they interviewed Belgian people and members of the Belgium underground about events that took place involving my dad and his crew, and they documented their testimony. And they gave me unbelievably detailed information about events that would have been lost forever without their dedicated research. So I owe them a huge debt. Initially, my dad didn't go into the Air Force as a result of the first peacetime draft uh, implemented by Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt in the fall of 1940. Uh, my dad went into the Army in April of 1941, and he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. And at the time World War II started, the U.S. military was woefully weak. They ranked 18th in the world in military strength behind Romania. And as you can tell by this World War I uniform that my dad's wearing, that they were very ill-equipped as well. Uh, three months later, in July, my dad married Ruth Hempel at First Lutheran Church in Pasadena, California. My mother was born and raised in Pasadena, as was I, uh, it was shortly after she graduated from UCLA, where she was a classmate of the legendary Jackie Robinson. I also went to uh, UCLA. When I was there, I was a classmate of Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, my dad was born in Norfolk, Nebraska, and he moved to California uh, prior to starting high school. A few months later, a day, on a date, I will live in infamy, December 7th of 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, and the United States was at war. Well, my mother was very scared. The uh, future was very uncertain. So at Christmas time, she went up to Washington to visit my dad. And nine months later, Susan Ruth was born. Well, at the time, my dad was concerned how was he going to support his new family as a new bride, a baby on the way. And he didn't think he could do that very well on a private's pay in the Army. So he decided to volunteer for the Air Force. And in June of 1942, he went through pre-flight training in Santa Ana, California, and then went through the various stages of pilot training. Uh, this slide is kind of busy, but it shows you the various stages. Uh, there were three main stages, uh, primary, then basic, and then advanced training. And if uh, you made it through primary training, you went into basic. And pilot training was really tough. 40% of the cadets that started washed out uh, and couldn't make it through. They either became bombardiers or navigators or perhaps gunners. Now, after basic, they separated the pilots out going into advanced training. Uh, they either went into single engine planes or fighters, or they went into twin engine planes, which resulted in bombers. Uh, typically, the shorter pilots went into the fighters because of the cramped cock conditions in the cockpit. My dad was six foot three, so he went into twin engine planes. But personally, I think it also depended on the personality of the pilots. It seems to me that those fighter pilots tended to be have big egos, be pretty cocky, risk takers, individualistic, uh, whereas the bomber pilots tended to be a, more, a little more level-headed and, and team players. Here you see the three types of planes he flew during pilot training up top. In primary, you have an old Stearman biplane. And then in uh, basic training, a multivalent single wing plane. And then in advanced training, a Curtis Wright uh, twin engine AT9. My dad graduated from advanced training in Douglas, Arizona in April of 1943. I mean, then he went to uh, transitional training in Pilot, Texas, where he learned how to fly a four engine B 17 bomber. From there, he went to Dalhart, Texas for operational crew training, where the various members of the crew came together and learned to operate as a team. And then once steamed ready, they were assigned overseas to the European Theater of Operations. On October 21st of 1943, my dad and his crew reported to the 306 Bomb Group based at Thurlai, England, which is about 60 miles north of London. Uh, this is what it looked like at the time. Uh, the base is no longer there, of course, but the countryside looks just the same uh, today as it did then. Uh, there is a nice little museum uh, there that my wife and I have visited a few times. Here you see the insignia of the 306 Bomb Group. There were three air divisions in the 8th Air Force. The 306 was in the 1st Air Division, which was signified by a triangle. And then every bomb group in the 8th Air Force 
8th Air Force has a de designated letter, and for the 306, it was an H. So the 306 bomb group was designated by a triangle H. Besides being the first bomb group to hit a target in Germany, the 306 bomb group was also the longest serving bomb group in the 8th Air Force. They arrived in September of 1942 and didn't depart until December of 1946. They stayed on after the war involved in the Casey Jones Project, which was the aerial photo mapping of Western Europe and Northern Africa. Uh, many of you have probably seen the 1949 movie 12 O'Clock High starring Gregory Peck. Well, that was based on a true story about the 306 bomb group. The fictitious bomb group in the movie, the night 18th, was derived by multiplying the 306 times three. Another distinction the 306 bomb group had is that their flight surgeon, Dr. Thurman Schuler, was responsible for convincing 8th Bomber Command General Ira Aker to implement a mission limit uh, in the spring of 1943. Prior to that, there was no mission limit. These combat crews just kept flying and they soon realized that they would never ever make it home. They would either be killed or shot down to become prisoners of war. Uh, Dr. Schuler suggested a mission limit of 20, uh, Acres set it at 25, but at least they had a light at the end of the tunnel and some hope of coming home to their loved ones. In every bomb group, there were four bomb squadrons. These were the four bomb squadrons in the 306 bomb group. Uh, my dad was in uh, the 369th fight Biden down in the lower right-hand corner. I always like to point out the uh, ground crews. Uh, the combat crews got all the recognition, recognition and, and the glory, but it was these ground crews that kept these planes flying. Uh, when these bombers would come back after missions, these bomb crews would stay up all night long, usually in inclement weather, rain, sleet, snow, uh, repairing battle damage, doing maintenance on the plane, replacing engines, uh, replacing tires, what have you. And uh, they took great pride in the, taking care of these planes. And they really considered these planes their planes that they just loaned out to the combat crews to fly missions occasionally. Here you see my dad's crew, uh, B-17 had a 10-man crew. In front, you'll see uh, four P uh, crew members kneeling. Those were the officers. My dad is here on the lower left. He was the first pilot, and as such, the commander of the plane and the crew. And then going across, you had the co-pilot, the navigator, and the bombardier. And then behind them stood six enlisted men or non-commissioned officers who were mainly gunners. Five of these men came home. Five of them did not. Uh, this is not the Susan Ruth. It's just a B-17 that they took the crew picture in front of when they arrived in England. And I always like to point out the nose art here in the upper left. Uh, I love the nose art. Uh, it's interesting that the Air Force was the only entity to allow their planes to be painted and named. Then uh, The Marines didn't, the Navy didn't, nor did other countries. But the Air Force thought it would help the morale of these young guys if they could personalize their planes. And they were very creative in what they painted on their planes and named their planes. Many times it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, it was a scantily clad or, or nude woman. After all, these guys were in their late teens and early 20s and, and virile young men. The 306 bomb group flew B-17 uh, bombers. Uh, of the three air divisions in the 8th Air Force, the 1st Air Division and 3rd Air Division flew B-17s. And then the 2nd Air Division flew B-24 Liberators. Uh, the B-17 was nicknamed the Flying Fortress because of the armament that it had on the plane. It had 12 to 13 50 caliber machine guns. It could put out a tremendous amount of firepower. Uh, every plane was identified by tail markings. Uh, here you, again, you see the triangle H of the 1st Air Division and the 306 bomb group. And then each plane had an identification number that was assigned by the manufacturer. Uh, the Boeing company uh, designed the B-17 and manufactured 60%, but Lockheed Vega and the Douglas Aircraft Company each produced 20% uh, as well. There were three types of B-17s that were flown in the European theater of operations. Initially, it was the E model, but they only built about 500 of those, and that was quickly replaced by the F model. And then they were gradually phased out in the fall of 1943 by the G model, which was the definitive uh, B-17 model. And you can always tell the G model by the chin turret underneath the nose of the plane. Here you see the crew positions on the plane. Again, this was the uh, G model with the chin turret. Up in the front in the nose, you have the bombardier, and then behind the bombardier, the navigator, 
Then the two pilots, and above the pilot, you have the flight engineer, behind him, the bomb bay, and behind the bomb bay, the radio operator, below him, the ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, and then a tail gunner. The bombs hung up in, in the bomb bay on racks, um, as you can see here, and it's really cramped in the bomb bay. That catwalk is only eight inches wide, and this young boy is only eight years old, so you can see how cramped it was. It's more crowded in a B-17 than it was in a submarine. And occasionally, uh, these bombs would get hung up on the racks during a bomb run, which require one of the crew members to either kick it loose with his foot or knock it loose with a wrench. And when those bomb bay doors are open, you're looking five miles straight down to the earth with the wind howling all around you. So that took some courage to do that. Here you see the crew positions a little more clearly. Uh, this was the F model without the chin turret. Again, in the nose, you had the bombardier. His main job was to drop the bombs accurately. But in the G model, when they were, uh, the plane was under attack by enemy fighters, he manned the uh, chin turret. And behind him was the navigator. He did, needed to know where they were and where they were going. Uh, and when they were under attack, he manned cheek guns that were on each side of the nose. Then you have the two pilots. In the left seat was the first pilot, uh, my dad, and then the right seat was the co-pilot. And you needed two pilots to fly these planes, and not just because if one was injured or uh, killed, you had another guy that could do the job. But it was very strenuous flying these planes. These missions were six to ten hours in length, so it was very tiring. And back then, it took muscle to fly, the, fly these planes. But they had to stay alert at all times because they flew in tight formations. And if they lost their concentration, they could clip a wing on the plane next to them or run into the plane in front of them and go down. Also, they had to continually fight air turbulence. Uh, you had the normal weather turbulence that many of us have experienced in commercial flight. But they also had the turbulence from all those bombers flying in such close proximity. So the Weight turbulence and prop wash of all those beings, all those bombers being into so close together would just churn the air and be like you were in a washing machine. Uh, above the pilots was the uh, flight engineer. He was also called the crew chief. He was kind of the onboard mechanic and knew how everything worked. Uh, when they were under attack, he would man the top turret. During flight, he would help monitor all the instruments that were in the cockpit. In a B-17, there are 150 different gauges and dials and toggles and switches. And the flight engineer would peer over the pilot's shoulders to help monitor engine performance and fuel consumption. And behind the bomb bay, you had the radio operator. He had the most comfortable position on the plane. He had a fairly roomy compartment, a chair he could, he could sit at. And then the most cramped position on the plane was the ball turret gunner underneath the plane. Again, these missions were six to 10 hours in length and at ball turret gunners in a fetal position for hours on end, which is a very uncomfortable place to be. And then above the ball, you had two waist gunners, which were the most expo exposed positions on the plane and another cramped position, the tail gunner. My dad flew his first mission on November 3rd of 1943 to Wilhelmshaven, Germany. It was the first time the 8th Air Force put up over 500 bombers on a mission. And flying combat was extremely dangerous and brutal. 26,000 men died in the 8th Air Force, which was more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific. Another 28,000 men became prisoners of war after their bombers were knocked out of the sky by either enemy fighters or anti-aircraft fire. Being a combat crewman in the 8th Air Force was the most hazardous duty assignment in the United States military during World War II. And it was dangerous from the time they took off from the time they landed. At its peak, there were 40 bomb groups in the 8th Air Force in an area of England called East Anglia, which is about the size of Ver Vermont. And these uh, bases were only about five to 10 miles apart. So on the day of the mission, you could have hundreds of bombers all taking off at the same time. And back then there was no radar, there was no air traffic control, and usually the weather was pretty cummy. It was socked in with clouds and you couldn't see anything until you got above the cloud layer. So mid-air collisions uh, were not uncommon and airmen were lost. And then these bombers had to form up. Individual planes formed up into three plane elements, elements formed up into bomb squadrons, bomb squadrons formed up into bomb, bomb groups, bomb groups formed up into combat wings, combat wings formed up into air divisions. And all this took an hour to two hours before they could even start their mission across the English Channel. 
Then they had to deal with the elements. These planes weren't pressurized. So above 10,000 feet, they had to go on oxygen or else they'd pass out in a couple of minutes and could die. It was also extremely cold at the altitude that they were flying. It was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero. So frostbite was a huge problem. And many men were hospitalized for lengthy periods of time because of the seriousness of their frostbite injuries. Uh, one of my dad's waist gunners were in, was in the hospital for two and a half months due to frostbite. Here you see uh, a combat uniform. Uh, this is a waist gunner uh, wearing a steel helmet, his tinted goggles, his oxygen mask. Uh, that's a flak jacket that he's wearing. It's like an apron with metal plates in the front and the back to help protect him. His fleece lined uh, jacket and pants and thermal gloves and boots. Uh, this white uh, belt uh, around his waist here is his parachute harness. It was so cramped in a B-17 that they didn't wear their parachutes. Uh, if they needed to bail out, they had to have their wits about them to find their parachute first and then hook it on clips or clip it on hooks on the back of the harness and then bail out of the plane. Again, I'll point out the, uh, the nose art on the plane. This is actually a B-24 Liberator, not a, a B-17. The next thing they had to deal with was enemy fighters. Uh, Germany set up radar stations along the continental coast of Europe, so they knew when these bomber formations were coming, and they'd send up their air force, the Luftwaffe, to meet them. Here again, you see a waist gunner manning his 50 caliber machine gun uh, in a flak jacket on here. You see all these spent cartridges on the, on the floor of the plane. That was like stepping on ball bearings or marbles. Uh, the ammunition for these 50 caliber machine guns came in belts that were 27 feet in length. So if a gunner fired the whole belt, they said he fired the whole nine yards. And a lot of people, me included, believe that's where that expression came from. The next thing they had to deal with, well, should I say uh, at the beginning of the air war over Europe, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these heavily armed bombers flying in tight formation could defend themselves from the Luftwaffe. And they flew in what was called a combat box formation. This was the combat box of a combat wing. And then within the box of the wing, you have three boxes representing bomb groups. And then within each bomb group box, you have three boxes representing bomb squadrons. So the theory was that all this interlacing firepower could ward off the Luftwaffe. Here you see another uh, illustration of the formation from behind on top and then from the side. It was a three-dimensional formation with a lead group, a high group, and a low group. But unfortunately and sadly, these bomber formations could not them defend themselves from the Luftwaffe. Even when uh, the 8th Air Force realized that and gave them uh, fighter escorts, the fighter escorts at the time in the early part of the war didn't have the fuel capacity to escort the bombers all the way deep into Germany and back. They could go get across the English Channel, but then they'd run low on fuel and have to turn back to England. Well, the Luftwaffe would just wait until they turn back and come in and attack uh, the bomber formations. In the early uh, years of the war, particularly 1943, the Eighth Air Force took devastating losses. Even though that mission limit of 25 was implemented, it was statistically impossible to complete 25 missions. The average number of missions flown in 1943 before being shot down was only six. And the losses culminated in the fall of 1943 in October over what was referred to as Black Week, where over four missions, the 8th Air Force lost 148 bombers, 1,500 men. The worst day being October 14th, referred to as Black Thursday, when 291 B-17s were sent to bomb the wall bearing factories at Schweinfurt, Germany, and 60 of them were shot down, losing 600 men. 10 of the 15 B-17s of the 306 bomb group were lost. Well, the 8th Bomber Command was in shock after that. There was absolutely no way they could sustain those types of losses and considered discontinuing daylight bombing. And it wasn't until right in the end of 43 in December when the P-47 Thunderbolts uh, received ex external fuel tanks, drop tanks, and the introduction of the P-51 Mustang, where these bomber formations finally had fighters that could escort it all the way deep into Germany to the targets and escort them all the way back. 
Uh, the P-51 Mustangs were particularly uh, effective. Uh, by the time D-Day rolled around on June uh, 7th, June 6th, excuse me, uh, the Luftwaffe had been decimated and the Allies not only had air superiority, but air supremacy. supremacy. The next thing they had to deal with was anti-aircraft fire. Uh, this was a flak gun. Flak was a German abbreviation uh, or abbreviation for aircraft defense cannon. These were deadly weapons. Uh, they fired tw 20 shells a minute and they were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that these bombers were flying. And these shells were filled with all different shapes and sizes of razor sharp metal called shrapnel, which would burst out hundreds of feet and easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these bombers. Uh, the skin was so thin you could take a screwdriver and just poke it right through it. From a distance, these exploding shells looked like innocent black puffs. But as these formations got into the killing fields, these puffs got bigger, the explosions got louder, and shells exploding near the ships were just violently rocked, these bombers. If a bomber got hit directly, it would just disintegrate and disappear. If it knocked if these shells hit a wing and knocked them off, these planes would just plummet to the ground like a stone. Even though it was so cold at that altitude, my dad said he was sweating profusely with sweat and be clothes would be dripping wet because of the adrenaline running through his body. When these bombers reached uh, the target or near the target, uh, they reached a pre-designated pre point called the initial point, the IP, where they started their bomb run. And at that time, the first pilot would give control over the plane to the bombardier who would fly the plane through the Norton bomb site. It was tied into the autopilot of the plane. And the Norton bomb site was a revolutionary device. It was an analog computer that could calculate various factors, such as the altitude the plane was flying, the speed that the plane was flying, uh, the wind direction, uh, wind speed, so they, they, the bombardier could accurately drop the bombs. And they were highly secretive as well. The bombardiers had to take an oath uh, to defend these uh, bomb sites with their life. Well, little did the U.S. Uh, know at the time that the Germans had a spy in the Norton Bombs factory, Hermann Lang, and they knew all about the speci specifications of the bomb site. Here you see the bombardier looking through the crosshairs of the bomb site. And when he released the bombs, he yelled, bombs away. And that... Uh, notified the first pilot to take control of the plane back. And then he would make a big turn to get the heck out of there and go to another designated point called a rally point, where the bombers who made it through the bomb run would try to form up again and head back to their bases in England, where once again, they would face enemy fighters. And even when they did reach England, they had a number of dangers they faced. Uh, first of all, uh, once again, uh, the English weather could be bad and they could uh, be socked in with clouds and they couldn't even find their bases. Uh, these bombers could be running out of fuel. You could have uh, injured or dead pilots on board. Uh, the planes could have a lot of battle damage. Uh, engines could be out, flight control shot out, uh, landing gear that wouldn't come down, brakes that didn't work. So coming back to their bases, uh, crash landing occurred and more airmen were lost. It was on a bombing mission to Frankfurt on February 8th of 1944, when my dad's plane, the Susan Ruth, dropped its bomb successfully. But the bomb bay doors got hit by flak and they couldn't get him back up. And as a result, that caused a drag in the plane. They lost airspeed and they fell behind the bomber formation heading back to England. And they were singled out by two German Focke-Wolf fighters. And like wolves or lions uh, on prey, they swooped in, attacked the Susan Ruth in the ensuing air battle. The Susan Ruth was shot down. But both those German Focke Wolf fighters were shot down at the same time. One was piloted by Siegfried Merrick. His plane crashed and he was killed in the plane. And the other was piloted by Hans Berger, who was able to bail out and he made it through the war. Uh, one day during my research, my wife, Glenda, said, well, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? And I thought to myself, oh, gosh, she's naive. She has no idea what she's talking about. That would be impossible. But being a good husband, I did what she told me to do, and I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war and speaks perfect English. And he gave me some wonderful insights that are in the book about what it was like. 
to go up against the 8th Air Force. As I mentioned earlier, the book goes into detail about what happened to each member of the crew, but I don't have time to uh, go into that today. Uh, you'll need to read the book to find out that. Uh, I'll just say that some of the crew died in the plane. Some became prisoners of war. Some evaded capture and made it back to England. And some were killed, uh, murdered later on the ground. After my dad bailed out, he came down in some trees right at the French-Belgium border. And his parachute got hung up on the branches and he couldn't get down. He was dangling 20 feet off the ground. But fortunately for him, a couple of young Belgian men, Henri Franken and Raymond Dravin, came to his rescue before the Germans got to him. Uh, they brought a ladder and a, a rope uh, from the farmhouse to help him get down this tree. Uh, that's Henri Franken uh, standing next to the tree. They helped my dad down. Uh, Henri sent this picture in the previous one uh, to my dad after the war. There's over 200 time period photographs in the book, so you can visualize everything that you're reading about. Uh, this occurred early in the afternoon, a little after uh, noon. And they told my dad to hide, uh, and they'd come back at nighttime to get him. They thought it was too dangerous to try to move him in daylight because there were German patrols combing the area looking for these guys that bailed out. So that night, they took him to the Devan farmhouse, and that house is still there today. Uh, that house is in Belgium, but those trees are in France. So it, it, it is right at the French-Belgian border. And he stayed there one night. Uh, again, they thought it was too dangerous for, stay, for my dad to stay there any longer than that, with those German patrols still in the area. So the following night, a Belgian customs officer, Paul Tilken, uh, came on a tandem bicycle uh, to take my dad to a safer location. Uh, he brought uh, another customs uh, officer uniform. They wore capes and a little pillbox hat. And so he and my dad uh, took off in the middle of the night. Uh, my dad said it was uh, pitch black, uh, raining, and they headed out. My dad had some strap in the wounds in one leg, though, so he could only pedal with his good leg. And they came to a hill and were no longer to pedal up it. So they started pushing the bike up the hill. When they came to the top of the hill, uh, they came to a little cafe. Uh, this is what the building looked like in 1994. It's still there today. And the lights were on, music was playing, uh, people were laughing, talking loudly, and all of a sudden, two German officers come walking out with these two young French girls. And one of them comes up to my dad, puts his arm around him, asks for a light for a cigarette. Well, my dad was petrified. He couldn't speak German, uh, couldn't speak French at the time. But fortunately, Paul knew what they wanted, and he lit their cigarette, and they let him go on their way. My dad, Ted, said these uh, German officers were too drunk, or as he said, schnockered and too interested in these young girls to pay much attention to two Belgium customs officers pushing a bike up in the rain. And after that, my dad was moved from place to place to place. How often he had, or how long he stayed in any given location was determined how brave the Belgian people were who lived there and how brave or how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it was for him to stay there. He might spend one night, he might spend six weeks. Uh, here you see my dad with a few of his helpers. He had many more than that. Um, they put a beret on my dad to try to help him blend in with the locals. But my dad was six foot three, so he was quite a bit taller uh, than the locals. And the people who helped my dad, or any down airmen for that matter, were unbelievably brave people. They risked not only their lives, but those of their family and friends. Because if the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out about it, they'd be uh, arrested sent to prison, tortured, and even shot, or sent to concentration camps. And some of the people who helped my dad and other members of his crew didn't meet that fate. Here you see, uh, see two women that my dad stayed with lengthy periods of time. On the left is Josiane Bayou. It was with her and her husband, Maurice, that he wrote his diary. And then on the right is Jeanette Gadin. Uh, her husband was a captain in the French army who had been captured when Germany first invaded the lowlands in May of 1940, and he spent the remainder of the war as a POW. It was very st stressful for my dad <laughs> to, uh, to be hiding. Uh, after all, his plane was attacked, it's on fire, he's shot down, has to bail out, comes down in a foreign country, has no idea where he is, doesn't know what happened to his buddies on the plane, can't communicate with the US military, is being helped by complete strangers. Uh, they can't speak each other's language. My dad had a little English uh, French dictionary in his escape kit that he could try to refer to. And any of these people might be collaborators and turn them in at any time. 
And he had several close encounters where he was almost discovered. Uh, normally, when the underground came across down airmen, they tried to get him back to England through various escape networks down through France over the Pyrenees into Spain and then out through British control, control Gibraltar. But something always went wrong trying to get my dad out through these networks. And he became very frustrated. Uh, this is uh, the Bayou home. Uh, this is on one occasion where he was almost dis discovered uh, one evening. Uh, the Germans came, pounded on the door, and uh, Maurice told my dad to get up on the roof and hide. And then once the Germans were gone, he'd come back and get them. But he never came back to get them because the Germans never left the area. And I've been in this house, and unfortunately, you can't see it from this uh, picture. But to get up on the roof, you have to get into an attic, and there's a little tiny window you have to crawl through. And that roof is really a steep pitch, and it's a tile roof, and it's really scary even to get up on the roof, let alone stay there all night, uh, not knowing whether you might be discovered by, by, by the Germans. And finally, my dad got tired of hiding. Uh, word came that the Allies had landed at Normandy on June 6th, and he decided to get back into the fight. Unlike most airmen, uh, he had that year's experience in the infantry, so he knew how to fight on the ground and decided to join the French resistance. His helpers tried to talk him out of it because it was too dangerous. Uh, he could die fighting, or if the Germans caught him and captured him fighting with the resistance, he'd be shot on the spot. But he was uh, adamant about it, and uh, so one of his helpers, Amy Cools, accompanied him uh, riding bicycles across the border into France, and he met up with a unit of the French resistance. This is not his unit, but it gives you an idea of what they look like. Uh, the French resistance, uh, referred to as the Maquis, were made up of small independent uh, ragtag and willing groups all across France, and their job was to harass the Germans. They would uh, attack convoys, disrupt communications, sabotage railroad lines, assassinate German officers. They were given their instructions uh, by the British over the BBC through coded messages. My dad said they were amazingly accurate. They said if a German convoy was coming down this road at this day, at this time, sure enough, they'd be there. And that was a result of the British cracking the German Enigma code and knowing everything they were up to. And they were also supplied by the British through airdrops. Uh, the group my dad was with stayed in this farmhouse in uh, Wallers, France. Uh, here you see my dad in front of the farmhouse. This picture was taken in 1994. And he stayed in this little tower. You see these two windows up here. And on one occasion, he was uh, early. It was early in the morning, just, just dressed in his skivvies, uh, shaving cream on his face. And he looked out those windows and saw a German patrol coming up the road. So he hightailed it out and jumped out of these uh, windows, kind of grain windows in back of the farm and ran into the woods to avoid being captured. And there are several instances described in the book of encounters that uh, his Mackey group had with the Germans that are quite thrilling and, and, and exciting. Here you see my picture of my dad fighting with the French resistance. Who took this picture and how it ever got back to my dad, I don't know, but it's one of a kind, uh, that's for sure. Finally, seven months after my dad bailed out, word came that there were U.S. Trips, troops in the nearby village of Trelone, France. So my dad walked into the town square, went up to an army major. Actually, it was a unit of uh, Patton's 3rd Army, which was to come up through France after D-Day. My dad identified himself, and they interrogated, interrogated, interrogated him to make sure he was who he said he was. And then he caught a uh, ride on a convoy, taking German prisoners to Paris, and then hopped on a transport to get back to his base in England, where he sent a telegram to my, my mother, his wife, saying he was a fit as a fiddle. Here you see a map of Belgium. Belgium's a unique country. It's divided in through. The upper half is called Flanders. And it's rather industrial, and they speak uh, Dutch or a dialect of Dutch called Flemish. And then the lower portion, portion of Belgium is called Wallonia, where they speak French. And my dad uh, and the crew and the plane all came down uh, in the southern portion here of France, of Wallonia. And my dad was hidden in Charleroi for quite some time. And then that farmhouse in Trelone, where my dad uh, met up with the U.S. troops, is located uh, around here. Uh, the Belgian people are wonderful people. To this day, they are still so thankful and so grateful for the Americans and allies coming to rescue them and liberate them from four years of Nazi occupation and Nazi oppression. 
and they do a great job of educating the younger generations as well. Uh, Dr. Delahaye, who I mentioned earlier, formed the German, or Belgium American Foundation in 1984, and they erected a number of memorials in the area. And on the anniversary dates of, of those events, they have ceremonies to remember and honor what took place. But the big celebrations always center around uh, September 2nd, which is when the U.S. Army first liberated Belgium. And they last several days. Here you see a poster from uh, the 70th anniversary. And they're wonderful events. They uh, erect these huge tents. Uh, this is just a portion of one. Uh, they have band concerts and dances and lunches and dinners. And they're wonderful events. Uh, the locals dress up in period uh, costumes. And the local beer, Chimay, just flows. <laughs> and everyone has a wonderful time. But they have a lot of uh, serious uh, events as well. Uh, this is one at the memorial at Sendron, which is right at the French-Belgian border, where the 9th U.S. Infantry first crossed over the Wartraz River from France into Belgium to liberate the country. And all the villagers come out, all the local uh, dignitaries make speeches, the U.S. military, the Air Force is represented, the Belgian military, the French military. Uh, the U.S. ambassador to Belgium comes down with an entourage, uh, and they're very moving events. Uh, here you can see in front all these young people, again, emphasizing the importance uh, to remember. Here you see the memorial that was erected to uh, my dad and his crew in 1989. And like most World War II veterans, my dad didn't talk a lot about the war until then. Uh, he and three other members of uh, his crew that were still living at the time went over for the dedication. And there my dad was reunited with Belgian people who hit him during the war and visited places where he stayed. And that brought it all back. And he started talking about it. Here you see my dad at the dedication of the memorial. Uh, the bearded gentleman here is Dr. Paul Delahaye. Here's my dad with his red, white, and blue tie. Uh, this is Jeanette Gadin, who I showed you in an earlier photograph. This is Nellie Telcan, the shorter woman. She was the wife of uh, Paul Telcan, the customs officer who helped my dad. Uh, two months after he helped my dad, he was arrested by the Gestapo and sent to prison and tortured and narrowly escaped being executed, but he never really recovered from the punishment that he took and he died in his early 50s. And this, this gentleman in the trench coat is the other man who helped my dad down from the trees, Raymond Durvan. I've been to Belgium six times. The first time I went was in 1984 with my parents. This is me and my dad and my mother and my sister, Nancy. And that's when it became personal for me because I saw firsthand all the places that my dad talked about and where the events happened. Here over to the right, you can see all the military vehicles. They have a military vehicle parade and set up a U.S. Army camp. But uh, they're just uh, wonderful events. On two occasions after visiting Belgium, I went on to Munich, Germany to visit that Luftwaffe pilot, Hans Berger, that shot down my dad's plane. And we become friends. Uh, he'll turn 100 years old uh, this coming October. Here you see us at his, in his apartment in Munich, Germany, wearing his fighter jacket. And you can't really see it here, though, but his Iron Cross. Uh, he shot down seven B-17s and one Spitfire. But he was shot down three times himself. Almost all his friends were all killed during the war. The only reason I think he made it is that at the beginning of 1945, he was pulled out of combat to become a test pilot for the, eight, uh, the Hinkle HE-162 single engine fighter that the Germans were trying to perfect, uh, which they never did. And then finally, here you see uh, Hans and me having a cold one at the Hofbrau House. This is a photo of my dad and me at uh, World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., uh, taken in 2004. It was in early May, uh, a few weeks prior to the official dedication of the memorial. And he wanted to go see it before he died. And I accompanied him uh, to a reunion, of the Air Force's Escape and Evasion Society reunion. And it was the last trip he ever took. Uh, my dad wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was the oldest at 91. And today, all the World War II veterans are in their late 90s or early 100s. At the end of World War II, there were 16 million World War II veterans. And as you can see from this graph, which is a little outdated, but still, uh, those numbers have been decreasing rapidly. And today, there's less than 1% of these men still with us. There's no other event in history that affected more people than World War II. 
60 million people died. Millions more were wounded. Millions more were left homeless and displaced. It changed the course of America and the world forever. And the brave young men who fought and died to preserve freedom must never be forgotten. It is our duty to remember. Well, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions uh, that you may have.